If you'll stand with me and you'll take your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Father, thank you again for your word. We look to your spirit, the author, to illuminate our minds. For Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we return back to the promise of Romans 8.28. Uh, we've been uh, in this promise for a couple weeks, and Lord willing, we've got to, uh, a little ways to go. Uh, and we want to really mine the riches deep in this promise. You've likely at one time or another in, in your life, you have run to this promise. You've cling to that promise, especially when it's dark especially when times uh, are overwhelming and circumstances feel there's no good at all in this. You have run to this promise, and you have clinged to this promise. Now, what we need to do as we look at this promise, we cannot just pull it out. We have to keep it within the context of what we've looked at in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18 and all the way through 30. This promise is in a very real way, this is the, the, the crest, this is the summit of Romans chapter 8. All things point to this promise. All things point to us being able to grasp this promise and to be an anchor of our souls when we feel the floodwaters of life coming over us. What we see then in uh, verse 28 and 29, especially 29, we see the purpose for which all things work together for good. And the purpose is, is that God is conforming us to the image of Christ. If there's nothing else I say today, you must cling to that. That every waking, minute of your, every waking minute of your life, that God is at work in your life. You may say, well, I don't know that. But the fact is, grace works 24-7. It works constantly in your life. And God is doing a good work in you if you're a Christian. And the good work is to shape you into the image of Christ. And if, if you're like me, which I know you are, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Is that we do need to be conformed to the image of Christ. Is that we, we, we even uh, go against the goad, so to speak, as Christians. But if that promise is going to bring you comfort, you've got to remember verse 29. You've got to remember that all things are working for the ultimate good. And the ultimate good is not your comfort. It is your conformity to the image of Jesus. And you're going to say, well, my circumstances are not good. I want you to start praising God for that. Because to praise God for the hard times in life is a mark of a child of God. It's easy. It's easy to thank him. And it's easy to quote Romans 8, 28 when it's calm seas in your life. It's when it gets real rough that then you find out whether or not this is true of you. And we also must uh, keep 28 and 29 in the context of 18 through 27. Because this promise overshadows the suffering that we will endure in this life. And Paul would say in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. And that glory revealed to us is being worked out through Romans 8.28 as we, as we uh, live each day. So make sure you keep that in the context of this. Now the promise that we're looking at of Romans 8.28, as I mentioned, we're spending a lot of time in this, and I don't apologize for that. This mind is very deep. There's a lot in this verse. There's a lot in this verse where uh, it would be easy to preach for months just on this verse. We started, we started with the very uh, beginning of the verse where it says, we know, and we know. This is the personal assurance of the promise. 
And you must ask yourself the question, do you know that this is for you? Are you in that relationship with God that you know this is for you? Without a conviction of assurance, without the conviction that this is for me, you won't be a confident Christian. And if you're not a confident Christian, you will not be an influential Christian. It's very hard to, uh, to try to convince or try to have a strong witness for the Lord Jesus Christ if you live in the spheres of doubts. We also looked last week at the giver of the promise. The giver of the promise. And that was God. God according to His purpose. And remember this. This promise is for you, but this promise isn't about you. This promise is about God, just like everything in the Scripture is about God. Prayer is even about God. We learned in our ABF this morning that we heard, uh, we heard a little clip from Alistair's uh, a sermon that he preached many years ago. And that we understand that our Father who arts in heaven, hallowed be thy name, is that even prayer is about God. So there's nothing in your life that is about you. Now, there's everything in life that is for you, all things that work together for you. Make sure you get that order right, because if you switch it and you make life all about you and all about what you're going through, you are not going to be a very joy-filled Christian. You are going to be so inward focused on you, and this promise is not coming true to you because you don't feel things are good. Next thing you know, this this morbid self-introspection leads you to anything but joy. So the giver of the promise then is God, and we noted four reasons why he is able to work all things for good. And you must remember this as well is that you have to have a strong conviction, not only that this promise is for you, but you must have a strong conviction about the God who gives this promise. And the strong conviction is this. Number one, he has the power to work all things for good. Secondly, that he is sovereign over all things, that he's able to work things good. And thirdly, that he is good, so he can only produce good. And make sure that you understand that, is that he works all things for good as defined by him, not by us. I find it uh, that my definition of good is more often a definition that includes my comfort and my convenience. And if you want to make a difference for Jesus Christ in your families and in your communities and in your workplace, there's two things it's not going to be. It's not going to be convenient. It's not going to be convenient at all. And the second thing, it's going to require uh, some periods where it's not exactly feels good. And we'll look at that today when we identify those who this promise is for. And then we also noted that uh, the fourth thing about the giver of this promise, that he is executing his will, his purpose. And it may not always look good. We'll look at Joseph as weeks ahead as we get down here. But we look at Joseph when he was taken to Egypt. It didn't look very good for Joseph, did it? And yet God worked all things together for Joseph and for his people. And now we're going to move on to the recipients of the promise. So we've looked at the personal assurance of the promise, the giver of the promise. Then we're going to look at the recipients of the promise. And this promise is conditional. It's not a broad promise that everybody can claim. Not everybody is a Christian that says they're a Christian. And it's important that we understand that there is a select group by which this promise applies to. And really one of my objectives uh, today and to follow on in weeks in here is for us to be willing to do the really difficult work of examining ourselves and ask the question, is it for me? Is this promise for me? Just because you say you believe, and just because you say this promise is for me, that doesn't make it true. There has to be, there has to be the evidence that this is real. And I'm not saying that to create doubt, and I don't want anybody to, 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 to walk away doubting salvation. One of the most assuring things you can do concerning your salvation is self examination. Francis Schaeffer said this quote, There is a limitation to this promise. All things do work together for good, but only for a certain group. 
The group this principle works for is those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose, end quote. And so if you look at verse 28, you will see that Paul makes it very clear that there is one, one, one type of person, the true Christian, and there's two qualifiers or two characteristics of those who are true Christians. And thus, because they are true Christians, they're able to rest they're all in all on Romans 8, 28. And what, what are the, the identifiers or the characteristics of these, uh, of these people who can, care, who can claim this promise? Well, we just read it. It's those who love God and those who are called by, by God. And so we want to look at today, who are those who love God? Who are those who love him? And you say, well, I love God, and, and, I would, and I would rejoice with you that you do love God. But it's very important that we examine ourselves to see if what we say is actually true. And again, that's not to create doubt in your life. If anything, it's to allow you to evaluate your life that should bring assurance as you see the evidence that you are truly one of those who love God. And so today is just the, uh, we're going to look at what, what is the first mark of those who love God. And then the next time we're back in Romans 8, 28, we're going to look at uh, the quality of those who love God under the title of, of uh, that, loving God. So the first thing is, if you were to um, evaluate yourself, okay, you read Romans 8, 28, and you say, okay, uh, this promise is for those who love God. Then you would say, okay, I love God. You should ask the next question. What is the evidence that I love God? Because it's so easy just to read this and perhaps even give yourself a pass. We can't do that. Too, too much at stake here. This is the identifier of those who are born again. Because the, the basic definition of a Christian is one who loves God. The whole purpose of salvation is not just to get God's wrath off of us. It certainly is a, a benefit of salvation. But the primary purpose of salvation is to create a forever family that loves God. That loves the Son. That loves the Spirit. And I'm so, I'm so concerned that sometimes we reduce salvation just a get out of hell free card. And we gotta, we got to remember that God is in the, in the business of sending his son, his promise in Genesis 3.15, for the purpose as that he brings a redeemed people in, in, into his family so that they will fulfill the creative purpose of the image bearers. And the, and the image bearers' purpose is that we would love God. That we would love him with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And you may sit there today and say, you know what? I don't love him with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, and all of my strength. And it, 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 it laments you that you wish, that's a good sign, by the way. Is if you are broken that you don't love him like he deserves to be loved, that is a very healthy sign. What do you think heaven is really going to be? Heaven is not just uh, what we read in the Revelation. It's that and far more. You know what heaven is going to be? Jonathan Edwards preached a, ser a sermon called Heaven is a Place of Love. And it is just, it's phenomenal. Is that we are going to a place of perfect love. Does it not grieve you, Christian? Does it not grieve you that you long to love God perfectly? That you, love, you long to love Him sincerely? You long to love Him wholly? You love, long to love Him with, with an absolute unwavering obedience? That should be the grief of every Christian. And Jesus would tell us, if you want to turn to John 14, I'm going to give you the simple definition of what's it, what does it mean to love God. It's found in one word. Obedience. Obedience. Look at John chapter 14. And we'll begin in verse 15. Now, not only do I not want to create doubt in you, but I also don't want you to leave discouraged and feel like you've just been, that you've been the, a sheep that's been beaten today. Because that, that's not my purpose. This is difficult as well as for the one who labored over this. It's because not only do I agree that I don't love God like he deserves to be loved, 
but I don't obey him to the extent that I want to. And that should be the, that should be the heartbeat of every one of you. If you're a Christian today, you should grieve that you don't obey him to the level that, uh, that you desire. But praise his name if he's given you the desire to obey him. Praise his name, though it's incomplete, though it's not perfect, someday it will be. And that's why we cling to the promise of Romans 8, 28, because all things do work together for good, even our incomplete obedience. Look at John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus says in the upper room discourse, the most intimate setting that he had with his disciples, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Go down to verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Make sure you pay attention to the tense of the verbs. The present tense continual. They're not saying, well, I obeyed him last week. Or I obeyed him when I made a decision for Christ, but my life has not changed. But yes, I'm a Christian. No, Jesus says, if you love me, then you will present tense right now in this fear, obey my commands. Verse 23, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Do you know what that word, you know what that definition, what Jesus is saying? It says, if you by your obedience show your love for me, then I'll fellowship with you. That's what the term, the phrase is, make our home with him. It is the same word that we get abide or to dwell in in John 15. Jesus is saying, if you obey, if you obey and and, and in that context, we will make our domain or our dominion or our abiding, our dwelling within you. Now go down to verse 24. He would give the opposite, which really cements the, uh, the issue. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. There is a refreshing simplicity about the Lord Jesus and the word of God. Yes, there are many things that we don't understand, but there's so many, so much more that we do. And it's in simplicity. Now, what I, as we look at this obedience as the sign that we truly love God, this is a time for self-examination. This is a time to ask the question, does my life reflect a, a progressive obedience to God's commands? Not perfect, but there should be an, a progressive obedience to God's word. And this does not mean... No emotion or affection. I think sometimes in reform circles, we're afraid of emotion. We're afraid of, uh, we're afraid of affection. But honestly, if you encounter Jesus Christ and you see yourself as a hell-deserving sinner and he reaches down with amazing grace and makes you a child of God, how can there not be affection? How can there not be emotion? And it will differ, differ, it'll differentiate between us. But I want us to understand that the obedience that we're going to look at, it is not based on emotion. It is not based on feelings. It is not based on any of those subjectiveness. And a lot of times we get too wrapped up in the subjective experience and if we don't have that, our, our obedience will go low. And if you don't have joy in the Lord today, the first place you need to look at is your level of, of obedience. Because as we obey, so goes the promise of the indwelling of the Father and the Son. Now, that doesn't change the relationship. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but it will change your communion. It will change your understanding and your walk with the Lord Low levels of joy is always connected to low levels of obedience. But our obedience that Jesus would tell us in John 14, it isn't vague or generic. And what I want to do in in the time we have today, what I want to do is I want to give you some qualities or six types of obedience. And these will bear out through Scripture, but I want you to think about 
not in a vague sense obeying God, because I find in my life that if you don't purposely, if I don't purposely put known commands into practice, it's not going to happen. It's, obedience is always purposeful. And it's not driven by your circumstances. It's not driven by your feelings. And it's not driven by your emotions. It's driven by the Holy Spirit developing within us the discipline and the self-control by which we will obey. But again, it doesn't take away from the experience. But let's work our way through these types of obedience. Because I think in doing so, we will have a, we will have a, 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 a broad understanding of just what the obedience is that Jesus tells us marks us as being lovers of him. And if we, want, if we are going to be lovers of God, then that means Romans 8.28 is yours. Here's the first one. The first type of obedience that marks those who love God and that are able to um, hold on to Romans 8.28, it is dependent obedience. It is dependent obedience. John 15.5, Jesus would say, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He does not say, apart from me, you can do something. He says, you can do nothing. Are you convinced of that? Are you convinced that you are constantly and 24-7 dependent upon grace to empower you to obey? And right now, maybe your life is, is, is fairly smooth. You got some rough, rough stuff going, but you're handling it. Are you able to, are you able to say, I, without a doubt, I can't do anything without Jesus. But when it gets really, really hard, do you not have a tendency to rely on yourself? And here's two ways we try to do that. Maybe none of you here are people that have to be in control. Maybe you don't have to control your circumstances. Maybe you don't have to control people. You're just, as the wind blows, I'm good. I want everything to go according to my plan, to people be lined up with what I want, and my circumstances to cause me just a little inconvenience, not a lot. And Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And he's going to try that in your life. He's going to try that in your life. And he's going to put you in situations where you cannot do it on your own. But Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, now I don't want you to be unawares to the Corinthians of the suffering that we uh, encountered. He says, but God caused us to despair even of life himself, ourselves so that we would not depend upon ourselves. Have you learned that lesson yet, Christian? If you haven't learned that the, the umbrella of all obedience is dependent obedience, then you are likely then conforming to a moral code and not obedience to commands. Because if you're depending on yourself, if you're depending on yourself in, to, to do anything pleasing unto God, then you are do, doing that in the strength of yourself. And God says, my glory I will share with no one and that my glory comes from your dependence upon me. Paul would say this in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's a declaration of dependence. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. There's, there's the, the prime example of dependent obedience. Paul had total reliance for obedience, but he had total commitment to obedience. Get a hold of that. Total reliance for obedience and a total commitment to obedience. And that is the harmony of dependent obedience. So if I am going to love God and thus claim Romans 8.28, and if you're going to love God and thus claim Romans 8.28, it means that I have to have an obedience that is dependent totally on Him. So that when I, at the end of my journey, at the end of your journey, and we stand before Him, 
will be able to say, I am what I am by the grace of God. And I stand here because of the grace of God and the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all I am is what he has made me. And all I've done is what he has done through me. That's what the, Christ, that's what the Christian life is. It is a conscious awareness of the abiding Christ within and that we're constantly walking with the spirit of dependence upon him. You say, well, that's, that's hard to do. Well, that's why Jesus would say narrow is the way. And few there will be to find it. There's a second type of obedience that marks the one who loves God. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to have you turn with me on very, these various scriptures. I gave them to you on your outlines. You can study them on your own. Uh, but I want you to read them with me. All other type of obedience will flow from dependent obedience. And like I said, God will allow you to fail to teach you that lesson. If you could sit down with the Apostle Peter right now, you know what he would tell you? I learned so much more by my failure than any perceived success. And he would sit down and he'd say, you know what? It was a painful time when I denied him. But I saw Romans 8.28 work out in my life. Because my failure, as painful as it was in the beginning, it showed me for what I truly am, and that is a dependent person upon my Lord Jesus. And I would not want to go through that again, but I am so glad I went through that. And that's what will happen to you. And maybe it already has. Maybe you're learning this lesson. Maybe you've gone through the deep fires of the refiner's fire, and it has just emptied you of yourself, and you have failed You failed flat on your face numerous times over. Remember, he's working in you a dependent obedience and that you'll go through that and you'll look back and you'll say, he gave, he taught me things that I would never have learned without this hard trial. But the second type of obedience that flows from dependent obedience and given evidence that we love God, it's delightful obedience. It's delightful obedience. And before we read 1 John 5, Two and three, let me ask you this question. Is it the, the, the passion and the delight of your life to obey God? Is it something that you just have an inward passion? I, I want to love him, and I'm doing so because I am, I am striving with all my being to obey. But I'm also striving in the strength of his grace so that I can obey. It should be the heartbeat of every Christian to obey God with delight. 1 John 5, 2 and 3, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. There again is another indication of what love to God is. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And notice what John would add on, and his commandments are not burdensome. He says that they're not troublesome. They're not grievous to my soul. They're not so weighty that I just don't want to do them, but I'll do it anyway because I have to. Now, there are times that obedience must be done out of a sense of duty. But that doesn't mean that it has to be uh, an obedience that is not delighted in. I spent all those years in the Navy, you know, 24 years of it, and there was a lot of times... Uh, that I would have duty on a Saturday on, when the ship was in port, and I did not exactly want to get up and leave my family and go to the ship. Now, the consequences were severe if I didn't. But nevertheless, I looked at the whole thing, and, and for the most part, I, I delighted in serving my country. I delighted in, in being, with, uh, being in the Navy and, and serving and, and doing my part to keep the, uh, the sea lanes open. I didn't always feel that way. And you won't always feel like obeying God. And this is what will happen. If you just wait to uh, obey God when you feel like it, you're going to find a very inconsistent Christian life. Because more often than not, because of the remaining sin, we don't always feel on top of Mount Transfiguration and want to obey. But here's what you've you got to understand. Is that the measure of your maturity as a Christian will be what you do when you don't want to obey. Or you make excuses for not obeying. We don't get passes for that. 
We don't get any passes for that. Jesus never gives us passes on our disobedience. Disobedience of delight is just that. We long to obey him. But this, is the, this delight, delightful obedience is from the inside out. If it's just what you do externally, that's religiosity. That isn't acceptable. It's got to be from the inside out. It's not like the little boy whose mom told him, go clean your room, and he was whining and crying, says, I don't want to. And she said, go clean your room. And he knew that to disobey mom, there were consequences. And so he went. And as he headed to his room, he looked back to his mom and says, Mom, I may be obeying on the outside, but I'm not on the inside. And I wonder how many times that that's been true of us. That we don't have real communion with God. We're not walking in, in step by step, moment by moment. And we're not telling him, you know, I don't feel like it, but Lord, I love you, and I'm going to show you that I'm going to subdue my flesh, and I'm going to do what I know you want me to do, you've commanded me to do because I love you, and I'm going to prove it because I don't feel like it. There's, there's some Christians that they're just all over the place. They're all over the place because I just don't feel like it today. And I can't stress it enough. If you... If you base your walk with the Lord Jesus on feelings and emotions, you're going to be living your life in an amusement park on a roller coaster that's up and down. And how can you possibly be a good witness for the Lord Jesus if you're not consistent? Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. But there should be a pulsating desire in our hearts if we're going to love Christ, to love God, the Father, the Holy Spirit. There should be the very pulsating like the Lord Jesus when he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. It is my delight to do your will, Father. And even in Gethsemane, and we're going to look at Gethsemane tonight, when we look at Psalm 130 and learn some lessons out of the depths is that it's important to understand that Jesus sets the example in his humanness of learning obedience through the hard things. The wilderness temptation, but Gethsemane was, was agonizing. And he could say, nevertheless, not your will be done, not, not my will be done, but yours be done. It's basically Jesus says, I am going to obey you, Father, because my delight is to do your will. Have you come to that in your Christian life? Do you live your life with a pulsating desire deep inside to obey him? Those who make the most difference for Christ are those the people that obey regardless of circumstances, regardless of what's going on in their lives. Now turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Here's a third mark of the type of obedience that is acceptable to God and gives evidence that we do love him. And thus Romans 8.28 becomes an anchor of our soul. Dependent obedience gives way to delightful obedience. Then there's consistent obedience. Consistent obedience. I'm not saying perfect obedience. But parents, the best thing you can do before your kids is to show them a consistency in your spiritual lives. It's not going to be perfect. But it can be sincere. Christian in the workplace, the best thing that you can do is to give a consistency in your obedience. Philippians 2, 12 through 13, Therefore, my beloved... Now notice what Paul says of these young Christians. They're probably about 10 years in the faith. They're, they're babies. They're infants. These Philippian believers. Notice what he says. Therefore, my beloved... Can you imagine getting a letter from the Apostle Paul to our church? Dear Quinescent, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, staggering, staggering statement that the greatest Christian who ever would live would say to these believers, as you have always obeyed. That does not mean that they were sinless. But what it does mean is they obeyed with consistency. And that means short accounts with God. That means you don't harbor sin. 
That means you don't give, your pa- give yourself a pass when we disobey. He says, not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Do you know how your salvation is worked out in fear and trembling? It's Romans 8, 28, fleshed out. All things work together for good. You mean even the suffering? Yeah, even the suffering. Even when I've, I don't feel God's presence? Yes, even then. Even more so then. Paul recognized these believers were displaying lives of consistency in their obedience. What you could observe in these people and what I long for to be said of us is that we are practicing active, vibrant Christianity which is measured by obedience to God's commands. That's what makes a difference in the world. It's Christianity that is alive. Do you know what causes lukewarmness? You know what causes us to lose first love? It's a lack of obedience from the inside out. And it's that very, very passion to obey that causes us to depend upon the Lord Jesus. And in doing so, people take notice and ask us for the hope that is in us. There's a fourth type. There's a fourth type of obedience that's acceptable. And that's the example of Paul. Look at Acts chapter 26. And this is a submissive obedience. A submissive obedience. We see the example of Jesus in Gethsemane. He was submissive. Look at Acts chapter 26. This is uh, Paul's uh, conversion story. His account before King Agrippa. Acts 26 verse 12. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, notice what what happens next. This is the command that God gives, that the Lord Jesus gave Paul. But rise and stand upon your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. Deliver you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in him. There's numerous commands that the Lord gives Saul. I mean, gives, he gives Paul here. And when, when I read that, I'm thinking, well, where's he going to go? Shouldn't he have to get some supplies? There's nothing in here that would make, that would tell Paul what's going to happen. Now later on he would say, or, or actually earlier in the book of Acts, he says, I will tell him what he must suffer. There were clear commands, clear commands given by the Lord Jesus to the apostle Paul. And he did, it's like Abraham. Abraham tells, uh, God tells Abraham, I want you to pack up the trailer and I want you to head west. And Abraham's saying, okay, great, let's go. Where are we going? Well, don't worry about that, just go. How ludicrous is that in a sense? I don't say that with levity. Is that God doesn't tell us in advance what all is going to happen. That's why Romans 8, 28 says all things work together for good. He didn't tell us in advance. You know what that would be? That would be uh, not an exercise of faith. He gives us just enough that we know it's time to obey. Now, in in Acts chapter 9, you don't need to turn to this, but in one of the older translations, the same account that he gives to Agrippa, Paul said this to Jesus. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Have you said that to the Lord? In your walk with him, if you say, Lord, whatever it takes, I want to love you, I want to obey you, I want your will in my life, whatever it takes. Now, that is a dangerous prayer, but it's going to happen. 
because he's going to work out your salvation. He's going to empty you of you. You either can get ahead of the process or it's going to happen. He's going to have his will in your life. But I want you to look at verse 19 of 26. What do we have of Paul? Paul puts no conditions on his obedience. And this is what the type of obedience that's acceptable to God. It's submissive obedience. And it's submissive with no conditions. Look what Paul said, look what, uh, Paul said to Agrippa in Acts 26, 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient. Every aspect of God's commands to Paul, he strove to obey. In your walk with the Lord, are you saying, Lord, whatever it takes, accept? What about in your walk with the Lord? Are you saying, Lord, I want to love you, I'm going to obey you, I'm going to serve your church, I want to serve your people, but you got to leave this alone. Lord, whatever it takes, except don't do this. Lord, I want to be a vessel to send forth the gospel, but, um, but um, i got some things i got to work out first. That's not the obedience that's acceptable that gives love to God. It's the obedience that says, Lord, here it is. And it's with, with both palms open. We don't, we don't walk with him like this. We don't say, Lord, here, I, I'm, I'm willing to go and do whatever you want. I want to obey all your commands, but I got this here. There's just this one thing right now I got to hold on to. Maybe the Lord has called you into something that's going to challenge your faith. And your, your, your struggle or your stronghold is financial security. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a, a family thing. Is that we've got to be willing to come to him like this. And to lay everything down before him. And that is the obedience that, approves of, uh, that is approved by God. And it's the obedience that gives evidence of, of that you love him. Now he may not take all those things. But it's not so much that he will or he won't. The issue is our heart. Are we willing to open up and say, Lord, whatever And if he is God and has the power to work all things for good, and he's sovereign over all things, and all he can do is good, and it's for a good purpose, then why would we be reluctant to hold everything out? Here's a fifth type. We have two more. Here's the fifth type. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23. I pray you'll do some evaluation and ask yourself the question. Don't give yourself a pass and say, I love God. No. Let the Bible speak to you. And let the Bible say what it will say to you. And the Bible's going to say to you, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And then you have to ask the question, well, what does my obedience look like? Is it a dependent obedience where God gets all the glory for the strength he gives in me. Now, the evidence that, that that's true, and I want to go back on that for a minute, is that you will not care who gets the glory for what you do. And you will not be offended if someone doesn't recognize your service. You will not be offended whatsoever if someone is elevated and you are not. A dependent obedience says it's not about me at all. And if you got to seek a little glory, and if you got to seek a little recognition, if you get that in this life, you won't get it at the judgment seat. So make sure it's the right type of obedience. Don't look to be affirmed by using your spiritual gift in this life. Don't be affirmed by people saying, hey, this was great. Or don't, don't. And don't be, don't be so discouraged when, when perhaps no one, no one responds to your ministry. I'll tell you just one short story. I was at the, uh, I was over at SWAS, Surface Warfare Officer School Command, and I just finished a five-year, five-and-a-half-year sea tour on a fast, guided missile fast frigate out of Newport, and I got orders to go to, uh, to SWAS um, that was to teach junior officers. Um, I was assigned to the Combat Systems Department. Um, it was about 25 lieutenants, and, and there was two enlisted guys. There was this, a senior chief uh, quartermaster, and there was me. I was the, the operations specialist there. And um, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to have a witness for Christ there. So I went to the, uh, the CO of, of, 
of uh, Swast Dock. It was the division officer course, and he was my commanding officer on the fast frigate. So I had a really good relationship with him, and I was his Protestant lay leader on the on the frigate. And so it was a pre-commissioned unit, so I got to do a lot of good stuff there. But anyway, so he knew that I wasn't going to cause any issues by wanting to have a, a, a Christian Bible study there at SWAS. So I remember going in and, and asking the captain if I could do this and in the morning, have a little devotional for the students and the staff they wanted to come. And um, he said, I don't have a problem with that. Do it. So I remember putting a flyer up on the board and said, Bible devotions at 7 o'clock, 7 to 7.15, in the, in the uh, student lounge. And I made a nice flyer, and it was, it was, I thought it was good, and I was just so excited that I was going to get to do something. And so I posted, and I showed up. I showed up for a week, and nobody showed up. Nobody. And uh, I said, okay. So I went back there, and someone had taken my flyer down. And I didn't know, so I put it back up. I put it back up. So I went another week. I showed up with my Bible and the daily breads, and we were going to do ministry, and, and I'm thinking somebody's going to show up, and nobody showed up. There's 300 students there. There's nobody there, plus these 25 lieutenants. And so three weeks went by, and nobody showed up. But I wasn't going to stop because I really, I mean, I handled it pretty well because I had devotions with one person. That would be me. On the fourth week, a lieutenant a staff guy showed up, and I knew him, and not well, and he said, he goes, he goes I think I need this, and uh, he says, you know, and he was kind of open, he said, my marriage isn't where it needs to be, I used to walk with the Lord, he goes, I'm not where I need to be, and I think this might be good, and so we had some, some conversation, he started showing up, then a couple students showed up, and then by the end of the, uh, 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 end of the fall, in the fall, we had like 30 students showing up. And then I got this word that down at the Naval Academy, they were advertising this devotional period uh, in Newport once you get there in the division officer course. And I thought, you know, and over the course of the three and a half years I was there, probably 300 instances in JGs went through our devotional time. Now, I don't say that to draw attention to myself, but I was committed like it didn't matter. I believe God wanted me to do this, and if no one shows up, then that's his. He draws them. And so I say that to say all this. Obedience is not based on seeking the praise of people. It's not praised on being recognized by people. And it's not even measured by who comes to your ministry. It's measured by your faithfulness with only one goal. And that is to simply obey. And that's what 1 John 3, 23 shows us. And here's the fifth type of obedience. Simple obedience. 1 John 3, 23. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. How simple is that? You say, wait a minute, it's not easy. I didn't say it was easy. How simple is it? Believe on the Lord Jesus and love one another. It's simple. Do you know what confuses and makes our life complex? It's selfishness and sin. That's what makes our life that's what makes our life complex. It's selfishness. Al Martin said this, quote, What is the heart of true godliness? What is the essence of true discipleship to Jesus Christ? The Bible's answer is clear and simple. The Christian life is a life of principled, conscientious obedience to God's will as revealed in the Bible, end quote. Notice what the great preacher said. The Christian life is a life of principled, conscientious obedience to God's simple will revealed in the Bible. Friends, we obey on purpose. And if you're just waiting for a zap to obey, you're never going to get it. We obey, as I've mentioned numerous times, regardless of emotions, regardless of effectiveness, regardless of feelings, regardless of circumstances. Simple obedience. And it's so easy to compromise that. Let's close this out by, by one more thing. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Here's the final and the sixth type of obedience that really brings to, to head what the obedience in the life of the believer who loves God. And because he loves God, she loves God, then Romans 8.28 is for you. And we're going to call this familiar obedience. 
or family obedience. Friends, you must always keep, as I started this morning, you must always keep before you that salvation is all about a reconciliative work by Christ to make God your Father. Never lose sight of that. Because if you lose sight of the, of the relational aspect of Christianity, it'll be dull. And you will find yourself obeying externally. And you'll have all the outward lookings of a Christian, but not the inward reality of a Christian. Let me draw your attention to the bulletin here. On the very front, I got a vote. I got a, a quote there. It's, it's, it's something we're going to talk about next time we return to this. But this is by Thomas Vincent. Thomas Vincent was a 17th century English Puritan. He wrote a book, True Love for the Unseen Christ. Of all the books I've read, this is the top, top two of all the most influential books I've read apart from the Bible. This is what Vincent said. Quote, The life of Christianity consists very much in our love to Christ. Without love to Christ, we are as much without spiritual life as a carcass when the soul is fled from it is without natural life. Without love to Christ, we may have the name of Christian, but we are holy without the nature. Faith without love to Christ is a dead faith, end quote. And you could add to that, without obedience to Christ, there's no love for Christ. And when there's no love for Christ, because there's no obedience to Christ, we have the name of Christians without the very nature of Christians. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 15. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, notice these three words. These what you must always think of yourself in your relationship with your God. This is what will sustain your prayer life. This is what will sustain a life of acceptable obedience. He says, as obedient children. You know what happens in healthy families? And I'm sure many, if you not all of you, have experienced this. I know growing up in a real tight-knit family, we weren't Christians. But as we grew older as uh, the two boys in the family, I actually took pleasure in making my dad and mom proud because I obeyed them. And I'm sure you've done that too. Is that you want to please your father and your mother, not because they gained their favor, you had their favor, but you want to obey them because they're your mom and dad. You want to show respect because you obey them. That's what the Christian life in its all the simplicity is. We want to obey our Father. We want to obey our elder brother, the Lord Jesus. And when we drift away from that simplicity, that familial obedience, that's when the Christian life becomes real hard. That's when the yoke that we're wearing is not His. It's ours, and our yoke is extremely hard. It weighs us down to where any type of obedience that we think is obedience is actually morality. It's just morality, and it will show by your lack of joy, and it will show by your lack of communion with God. So may God help us to see that Romans 8, 28 is a wonderful promise, but it's only for those who love God, and to love God means we obey God, and there's six characteristics of the obedience that gives evidence that you truly love God. May he help us to see these things, and may we think on these things. So as I pray, we're going to take just a few minutes, and I want you to ponder these things. Just in the quietness of a couple minutes before the benediction, let's ask the Lord to do a searching of our own lives and say, Lord, what type of obedience do I have? Lord, is there any of these areas of obedience that are missing in my life? And then thank Him for the grace that restores and the grace that, that, that enables us to have the obedience that's successful to Him. Father, search us now, and we are so grateful that the Lord Jesus obeyed to the fullest so that we could be in your family. But we ask you, Father, that we would not give ourselves a pass, that we would ask the hard questions. Do I love the Lord Jesus based on what the Bible tells me? That it's an obedience of it's a, a love of obedience. And Father, help us to see if our obedience is dependent obedience. Help us to see if it's a type of obedience that is honoring unto you by being delightful obedience, by consistent obedience that when we fall down, we're quick to get back up. It's submissive obedience. We don't pick and choose the commands 
the easy ones to obey and lay aside the difficult ones. Help us to be totally submissive that we will have both palms of our hands wide open that everything in our life, our relationships, our material things, everything is laid before you. And Father, help us to understand the simplicity of obedience that you didn't make this complex. Thank you for dependent grace that makes it simple. And Lord, help us always remember that we're in family relationship and that our goal is to please you with acceptable obedience, not to gain your favor. We can't, but because we have your favor. Search us now, Father, for Jesus' sake. Father, would you help us to take time, even time on the Lord's day, to evaluate ourselves, sitting at your feet like Mary, feet of the Lord Jesus, and allow your spirit to search us. And help us to discern, Lord, the, the corrective voice of him. May we not be beat down, feeling condemnation. That's not of you. Everything you do in our lives are for good purposes. And may, maybe we need to evaluate our obedience Maybe we need to get off the fast track of life and realize the time necessary to you to search us, to know ourselves so that we can in turn be a people that obey you with the type of obedience that gives evidence that we do love you. Father, we need help, and we're so grateful that your grace is sufficient in all these things. And help us, Lord, not to be quick to just pass this over, for this is a matter of eternity. For you have said that we are to love you with a love that is incorruptible. And he who does not love the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. So Lord, thank you again for the, for the privilege of your word. Thank you for the, the worship that uh, we've offered to you. We pray it will be pleasing to you. And may you be honored to work these things out in our lives for the glory of the Lord Jesus and the salvation of souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.